Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our evening talk. Let me know if the audio is okay. I'm using a different interface now. If it's too quiet or too loud, please let me know. So last night we were talking about special experiences. And then I ended with the idea that the Dhamma might be likened to a parasite, which of course is the wrong word, but the idea was to add a little bit of shock value to the teaching. The idea being that the teaching is something new. It often changes something very fundamental about who we are in a good way. What I really maybe didn't get clear or should have been very clear is that it straightens out a lot of things about us that are crooked, that are causing us pain and suffering. So we remove a lot of things that we once maybe thought were part of our personality, part of who we are, and we've removed them, and then we add certain things. that maybe weren't there at all in the past. Anyway, tonight I wanted to talk about more special things. Today I wanted to talk about magic. Magic's an interesting topic. Often our our practice comes across as uh, buying into the materialistic or the materialist, physicalist outlook on life. We're very secular in our approach. So sometimes we may even be a little bit overcautious in terms of even mentioning those aspects of the practice, you know, we sometimes back ourselves into a bit of a corner where our audience is under the impression that we are physicalists in the sense that we believe that the reality is based on the laws of physics. But to some extent that's not really true of Buddhism. In the Buddha's teaching, the laws of physics appear to be somewhat malleable. I don't know how much of it's really true, but there is a lot of magic said to go on in Buddhism. And so the idea is that the physical world is fine if your frame of reference is the physical world. But the mind is this whole other realm. The power of the mind is in a whole other whole realm of its own, a whole dimension, I guess you might say. But it's not just another dimension of the physical world. And so it can warp and change the physical world in, in very fundamental ways. And so we have this, uh, this teaching that the Buddha gave on the six abhinya. Abhi means higher, 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 and Nya means knowledge. There's all sorts of interesting stuff. There's the idea of making yourself invisible or multiplying yourself, making multiple images of yourself. We have all these stories that appear fantastical. And the Buddha didn't claim to have come up with this sort of teaching. He talked about 
others and there are talks of, talk about non-Buddhists who to some extent are able to gain these magical powers it's not common but the boast is that it's quite common for Buddhists now I don't think it's very common for people who come and practice our teaching which is again why we have this sort of reputation or this um, appearance of being very secular or very not secular but very mundane very much reaffirming that reality is mundane well, there's nothing really mundane about Buddhism at all it's all about leaving behind the mundane and so the Buddha would paint this broad picture of magic One of my first teachers said to me, and I'm not sure if... I think maybe this is where I'll agree with her, but I, for the longest time I wasn't really in, a, in great agreement. She said, Buddhism puts the magic back into life. But she was talking about these sort of magical experiences. I don't know, in my 17 years practicing Buddhism, I haven't had that many magical experiences of that sort. more you hear about people claiming and you'll often you'll from time to time meet a Buddhist individual who can read your mind or at least know what, you, how, what you're feeling I've met people who could read emotions and it's not by looking at your face because they would suddenly look at you and, and, and be startled by your, your, your thoughts or your feelings People would say this about Ajahn Tong, no, I'm not sure. I never noticed such a thing with him. But then he's sort of a meat and potatoes kind of monk, I suppose. He's very practical and simple, not flashy, and certainly not showing off magical powers, whether he has them or not. But there is this ability to levitate we talked about yesterday and walking through walls. I says the first one is called Idi. Idi means magic magical powers. These are all the many types of myriad magical powers that one can gain. And then there's uh clairaudience and then there would be clairvoyance hearing things far away now this one actually is relatively common among meditators I mean relative to the rest of these you will from time to time get a meditator who says they've heard they start hearing things like they'll hear chanting sometimes it even gets to the point where they can hear it and they can identify it something far away they can hear I guess as far as Indy goes, another one is people will leave their bodies. Astral travel is a thing. Believe it or not, there are people who leave their bodies, fly through the air. The disbeliever might say it's all just imaginary. But there are those who who make, who make claims. Like I, always, I have this story that I feel comfortable telling because I wasn't a monk at the time. I was 13 or so. And uh, I saw something. I left my body and saw something that hadn't yet happened. And then when I went back into my body, I actually saw it happen. Premonitions. This is a common one, even outside of Buddhism. I think with this uh, woman, this teacher of mine... Um, what she was trying to get at is that we sometimes have a little bit of a narrow outlook on life. We see only what is in front of us, which, you know, for Vipassana is actually quite useful, but we fail to be able to see the bigger picture, or to see beyond this conventional reality. And so magic in some ways helps to broaden our horizons. There's reading people's minds, and then there's remembering past lives. I've talked to people who have remembered past lives through practice. There's actually a practice you can do. You try and remember 
you sit down, you enter into the jhanas, and then you try and remember what you just did before you sat down to meditate. And then when you can, and then you remember before that and before that, and you go back and back until you get stuck, and then you start back with the jhanas, and and eventually you can go further and further back until you can get to the moment of your conception, apparently. And then you can go beyond that, break through, and remember past lives. And the fifth one is is in regards to karma. There's this magical power of being able to see beings being re reborn, dying and being reborn. When someone dies, being able to know where they were reborn. There are I've heard people claim this, Buddhist teachers who claim this ability, who talk about knowing where people went. I think sometimes they're just sham artists. This one I think is fairly rare Even Ananda He would go to the Buddha to find this out Juttupadanyana The Buddha had this knowledge Ability to see where people went when they died So where I'm going with this All of this may sound a little bit wacky Like what good is this to us Especially my meditators here Are probably wondering where I'm going I'm already wasting their time listening no, there's a method to my madness. The point of this is, is that there is one magic. There are six abhinyas, and I've just sort of illustrated five of them. But the sixth one is um, asavakaya jnana. Asavakaya jnana is the destruction of the defilements. And this gets back to this idea of the transformation of one's being. You know, the Buddha was critical, actually, of all these other types of magic. He, he praised them as a sign that the practice of Buddhism really did lead to strong states of concentration. So he would brag about them, that his students had these magical powers. You know, as a means of showing how powerful is the mind and how powerful is Buddhism. Because these are the sorts of things that people would... would... Uh, Look towards and strive after I'm, There was this monk I've talked about him before in, in California I think he's still there and He would he had the power to be able to heal people He would could see inside their bodies And know what was wrong with them He'd be able to prescribe medicines And even give medicines from time to time and So I was fairly critical of this Whenever people asked me about it Because it's it's really quite problematic People wouldn't When I was in California There was a lot of Thai people Who weren't all that interested In coming to learn from me Because Well I couldn't heal their sicknesses But worse than that People would go to him And he couldn't teach them meditation Because they weren't interested either He would be constantly busy He made He built a very large monastery In the north of the Mojave Desert and uh, but but he could never actually teach meditation because no one was interested. So there's a danger to this, and and further, people will always be skeptical and always be obsessed with it, and always be going further and further with the investigation of it. Further, they're not as certain as they may sound I mean a person who has mastery over their mind it takes a very strong and pure mind if your mind is not pure they can, it can these things can actually become perverted they can drive lead, drive you crazy I've seen monks who have gone crazy temporarily insane or even over the long term unable to get back to an ordinary state of reality because their minds have just been, become so warped with all this conventional you know that Messing with the fabric of reality But there's a magic that's beyond this A magic that is perfect and pure And I think it's good to think of The results of insight meditation as magic Because they're transformative, they truly are This isn't about 
simply curing um, your mental problems and but staying as the same person it's really transformative because curing all your mental issues curing the problems and the causes of our suffering really changes who we are and it changes our whole reality it's quite transformative in a, in a very magical way your life will change the people around you will change some people won't want to have anything to do with you anymore you won't want to have anything to do with certain people suddenly you'll be inclined in different directions and your situation will change magic things will happen simply by aligning yourself in the right way and, and retuning the mind to a new frequency to talk in such language you'll resonate with the universe in a different way so I think it's important to be open to this to not have some kind of attachment I mean it all comes down to attachment to conceptions how we conceive of reality attachments to ourselves to identity who I am attachments to the world what is this world clinging to this as a room as a building clinging to what we're seeing as a park clinging to our bodies as being somehow meaningful somehow ultimately real and somehow concrete and and uh, fundamental when they're not the world is quite malleable the universe is quite malleable if you don't believe in other kinds of magic that's fine but this magic this magic is, is far more transformative and it's transformative in powerful ways that we might even think not possible might even not realize A person who practices meditation will feel like they were asleep before. And they'll look back on the person they were before as though they were another person. In many ways, like a completely different individual. Asobakayanyana, the destruction of the defilements, of the taints. So this is what we aim for in the practice. Be open to it. Be open to your experience. Don't be afraid of pain. Don't be afraid of suffering. Don't be afraid of your mind. Abhinya is going beyond, is rising above the conventional reality. That's what abhinya means. In many ways you can do this. In many conventional ways and then there's through ultimate reality by seeing through this space and time seeing through people, places, things, concepts seeing through until you reach ultimate reality and you can experience reality as experiences arising and ceasing and when you break it down to your building blocks then you can rebuild it and you'll see it starts to rebuild itself. So the Buddha compared these two types of magic and he said the magic, the magic of learning, the magic of being taught and being instructed, this is the greatest type of magic greatest type of magic that there is so there you go I'm just going to give a little bit of Dhamma every day I won't give long talks because I'm here every day so there you go there's your Dhamma drop for today magic something we don't often talk about but important nonetheless putting the magic of insight meditation in its place. Okay, I've got, um, again, if you're interested in, answer, in asking questions, you're welcome to go on to our meditation site and post them there.
if you can't make it to this live session or if you can't come into Second Life. So I'm just going to read off on these. And go through them. I recently learned to let go of my breath while meditating. After a while in meditation, my body seems to naturally incline towards long breaths, where I breathe only about four to six times per minute. This leaves a lot of time between the breaths, where I have nothing to note. The state between the breaths seems empty, but it's pleasant and very calm. Is this correct? Or am I somehow unknowingly controlling the breath and slowing it down to get to this pleasant state? If potentially, there's always that, um, but but much more glaringly is the calm which you should be noting. If you're very calm and ple and and pleased by it, you should note that. If you're calm, say calm, calm. And if you like it, say liking, liking. You're not noting that, and that will always condition things. This is important. An important example of how the mind conditions things because most likely the mind that is pleased by the contentment or the calm is conditioning the breath it shouldn't normally be that slow how does the mind usually move through the realms of existence it is only is it only one step at a time or or only upwards like this animal human god or is it more chaotic? For instance, animal, god, human. There is a commentary that an animal can't go... Or it says the, the, the tradition is that an animal and a... You have to go through the human realm first, apparently. I mean, I'm not, no, that's not true. An animal can become an angel. And an angel, I think, can become an animal. So, in fact, those ones are all... I think interchangeable as I understand angels can go directly to hell the ghosts can become angels angels I guess can become ghosts the four sensual realms or the five the five sensual realms hell the animals demon uh, demons I guess and humans and ghosts um can, are all interchangeable but the Brahma realms the Brahma realms are different so to become a god the tradition is that you have to be human and from the Brahma realms you can only be reborn as a human there has to be an intermediary stage now this is the tradition it may not be true it may there may be cases I don't know if the Buddha himself ever said that but this is the tradition Do you know a meditation technique that releases subconscious baggage? I know that meditation does that, but I wonder if you know a technique that does it even better. <laughs> okay, so here's an example of wanting to speed things along to find a shortcut. And as I've said many times, trying to find a shortcut in and of itself is a problem because it leads you to want to find shortcuts and it's try an attempt to control things. It's a lack of patience and it's a lack of lots of other good qualities besides. So there's no good that can come of it. It's not useful. It's just going to add more baggage. It is baggage. Your desire to find a better technique than meditation is baggage. So, not a good idea. I also wonder about karma. In your karma video, you only talked about the suffering you will cause yourself if you think do harmful things. But what about doing positive stuff but with ego, ego, egoic reasons? For example, raising money for charity. You usually don't do that to help other people, the reason you do that is to enhance your self-image. Just because you do a lot of good things in your life doesn't mean you, you get good karma. Well, karma is... Um, karma is, for the most part, egotistical. Right? An enlightened being doesn't actually perform karma, per se, because they have no attachment. It's not only egotistical, it's out of desire. You do good things out of a desire for good things. Even if it's just happiness, right? We help others because we want to be happy. But an enlightened being uh, does good deeds just as a matter of course. It's called functional. They're inclined to good deeds simply by matter of course because they're pure. 
but they don't, don't have any desire for happiness, they're already happy. So if a person does things out of egotism, well, well, it, it's increasing your ego. If you do good deeds because you want good things, it's increasing your desire. And those are problematic. Those are, are going to lead to suffering. Now, there is something to be said that at the moment when you do a good deed, you're not, you don't have either of those things. You don't have egotism or you don't have desire or any of that. You have a wholesome mind state and that's why it leads to happiness. But there can be certainly a desire and egotism surrounding it, just not at the moment when you actually do a good deed, because that's, by definition, the good deed is free from those things. At the moment when you intend to help someone, there's none of that. But surrounding it, there certainly can be. And so this is where we talk about white karma, black karma, and white and black karma. I had in the morning done half walking and half sitting for 30 minutes and afterwards felt a great pull to do more feeling that I should be meditating or I need to meditate more. I do not believe that my issue is, not, is from not balancing walking and sitting because in the past I immediately felt blissful from just sitting and lying meditation or mainly lying meditation. Thus I believe it is simply that I am too attached and too greatly desire from the meditation practice that I am too greatly clinging. Would you support this? I don't know, I don't really want to contemplate all the things you're saying, but yeah, it's far too complicated. I think maybe you're overthinking things. If you have attachment and you desire something, then just say wanting, wanting. Even if it's wanting to meditate more, you can still note it. Don't analyze it too much. Would you say not faculties, but equanimity is the most important and that one should not fixate on the faculties? Yeah, I'm, I'm not... Yeah, really, it's too much of your own teaching in there. Try and make your questions a little shorter and clearer if you have a question for me. Not just, I'd think this and this and this, is that right? <laughs> in, in some cases that works, but... It's not really what we're here for. Do you think some of those magical powers may be manifestations of not one's abilities, but some other beings channeling them through, through us? It's interesting. Um, in my anthropology of religion class, we're studying the jinn. Or the jinn, I used to think it was, but there's, they're pronounced jinn uh, in Palestine. Because our professor actually lived in the West Bank and studied the jinn stories, these stories of possession. And some of it was interesting. There were the, these Palestinians in Israeli jails, and they would be visited by jinn who would tell them how their families were doing and what was going on with their families. And other things besides some, like uh, the people who would exercise the spirits, would be able to tell all sorts of things. Like it all sounds quite magical makes you wonder whether there's some real magic going on there. Um, in Buddhism there is a there is a, a sense, there's even a story in the Vinaya of some monks who one monk who goes to goes to get a robe from the charnel ground where they just throw the bodies and he sees this fresh corpse and he pulls the robe off of it and the, the spirit that's hanging around gets back into the corpse and chases after him <laughs> and he has to run back to his kuti being chased by this zombie until it falls down he shuts his door and it falls down dead at his door I think the Buddha gave some advice I can't remember what the advice was like make sure it's dead or wait for a few days before you take the robe or something like that or go, don't go alone to the charnel ground maybe it was so yeah, I think Buddhism does uh there's certainly there are certain remedies in the medicines and there's really about medicines how to deal with spirit possession so it's okay if if you eat blood and and raw flesh when you're possessed by a demon that you don't break a rule because you're possessed by a demon so yeah there certainly is a an admission of that of a, of a belief in that sort of thing 
Did I have a live question? Did I see a live question here somewhere? Let me see. Doesn't the commentary say that there won't be arahants who have mastered the abhinyas after the first 1,000 years from Buddha Parinibbana? A uh, person who has all six, yes. But, I mean, it's just a commentary, and I think it's, uh, I don't know, some of those believe them if you like, don't believe them if you don't like. I mean, these kind of very set statements, you often want to say, meh. It's a bit strict, you know. I mean, why should it be that exactly after 1,000 years suddenly there are no more? But after, f you know, two and a half thousand years, will there, is there likely to be anyone with all six? Not very likely. Is it possible that there are none? It's quite possible that there are none. I guess it's maybe quite likely that at this point there are none. Alright, well, that's it for the questions. Thank you all for coming. Wish you a good night.